I turned my attention to the wall, hoping for evidence which might suggest another theory. That wall had been an example of the worst snide construction. Though little more than a year old, the parts left standing showed evidence that they had begun to decay the day the last brick was laid. The mortar had fallen from the interstices. Here and there a brick had cracked and dropped out. Fibrils of the climbing vines had penetrated crevices, working for early destruction. And one side had already fallen. It was here that the first glimmering suspicion of the terrible truth was forced upon me. The scattered bricks, even those which had rolled inward toward the gaping foundation ledge, had not been coated with scum. This was curious, yet it could be explained by surmise that the flood itself had undermined this weakest portion of the wall. I cleared away a mass of brick from the spot on which the structure had stood, to my surprise, I found it exceptionally firm. Hard red clay lay beneath. The flood conception was faulty, only some great force, exerted from inside or outside, could have wreaked such destruction. When careful measurement, analysis, and deduction convinced me mainly from the fact that the lowermost layers of brick all had fallen outward, while the upper portions toppled in I began to link up this mysterious and horrific force with the one which had rented the lodge asunder. It looked as though a typhoon or gigantic centrifuge had needed elbow room in ripping down the wooden structure. But I got nowhere with the theory, though in ordinary affairs I am called a man of two great imaginative tendencies. No less than three editors have cautioned me on this point. Perhaps it was the narrowing influence of great personal sympathy yes, and love. I make no excuses, though, beyond a dim understanding that some terrific, implacable force must have made the spot his playground, I ended my ninth day of note-taking and investigation almost as much in the dark as I had been while a thousand miles away in Chicago. Then I started among the darkies and Cajuns. A whole day I listened to yarns of the days which preceded Cranmer's escape from Elizabeth Ritter hospital days in which furtive men sniffed poisoned air for miles around Dead House, finding the odor intolerable. Days in which it seemed none possessed enough nerve to approach close. Days when the most fanciful tales of medieval superstitions were spun. These tales I shall not give, the truth is incredible enough. At noon upon the eleventh day, I chanced upon Rory Paleron, a Cajun and one of the least prepossessing of all with whom I had come in contact. Chanced, perhaps is a bad word. I had listed every dweller of the woods within a five-mile radius. Rory was sixteenth on my list. I went to him only after interviewing all four of the Crabiers and two whole families of Pichons. And Rory regarded me with the utmost suspicion until I made him a present of the two quarts of shinny purchased from the Pichons. Because long practice has perfected me in the technique of seeming to drink another man's awful liquor no, I'm not an absolute prohibitionist, fine wine or twelve-year-in cask bourbon whiskey arouses my definite interest I pooled Paleron from the start. I shall omit preliminaries, and leap to the first admission from him that he knew more concerning Dead House and its former inmates than any of the other darkies or Cajuns roundabout. But I ain't talking. Saker. If I should open my gab, what might fly out? It is for keeping silent, why are damn right, dot. I agreed. He was a wise man educated to some extent in the queer schools and churches maintained exclusively by Cajuns in the depths of the woods, yet naive withal. We drank. And I never had to ask another leading question. They made him want to interest me, and the only thing extraordinary in this whole neck of the woods was the dead house. Three quarters of a pint of acrid, nauseous fluid, and he hinted darkly. A pint? and he told me something I scarcely could believe. Another half-pint but I shall give his confession in condensed form. He had known Joe Sibley, the octoroon chef, houseman and valet who served Cranmer. Through Joe, Rory had furnished certain necessities in the way of food to the Cranmer household. At first, these saleable articles had been exclusively vegetable white and yellow turnip, sweet potatoes, corn and beans but later, meat. Yes, meat especially whole lambs, slaughtered and quartered, the coarsest variety of piney woods pork and beef, all in immense quantity. In December of the fatal winter, Lee and his wife stopped down at the lodge for ten days or thereabouts. 
They were en route to Cuba at the time, intending to be away for five or six weeks. Their original plan had been only to wait over a day or so in the piney woods, but something caused an amendment to the scheme. The two dallied. Lee seemed to have become vastly absorbed in something so much absorbed that it was only when Peggy insisted upon continuing their trip that he could tear himself away. It was during those ten days that he began buying meat. Meager bits of it at first a rabbit, a pair of squirrels, or perhaps a few quail beyond the number he and Peggy shot. Rory furnished the game, thinking nothing of it except that Lee paid double prices and insisted upon keeping the purchases secret from other members of the household. I'm putting it across on the governor, Rory, he said once with a wink. Going to give him the shock of his life. So you mustn't let on, even to Joe, about what I want you to do. Maybe it won't work out, but if it does. Dad'll have the scientific world at his feet. He doesn't blow his own horn anywhere near enough, you know. Rory didn't know. Hadn't a suspicion what Lee was talking about. Still, if this rich, young idiot wanted to pay him a half dollar in good silver coin for a quail that anyone himself included could knock down with a five-cent shell, Rory was well satisfied to keep his mouth shut. Each evening he brought some of the small games. And each day Lee Cranmer seemed to have used an additional quail or so. When he was ready to leave for Cuba, Lee came forward with the strangest of propositions. He fairly whispered his vehemence and desire for secrecy. He would tell Rory, and would pay the Cajun $500 half in advance, and half at the end of five weeks when Lee himself would return from Cuba provided Rory agreed to adhere absolutely to a certain secret program. The money was more than a fortune to Rory, it was undreamt of affluence. The Cajun exceeded. He was telling me then how the old man had raised some kind of pet, Rory confided, and wanted to get shed of it. So he gave it to Lee, telling him to kill it, but Lee was shot at by fooling him. What I ask here is, what kind of a pet is it that lives down in a mud sink and eats a couple hogs every night? I couldn't imagine, so I pressed him for further details. Here at last was something which sounded like a clue. He really knew too little. The agreement with Lee provided that if Rory carried out the provisions exactly, he should be paid extra and at his exorbitant scale of all additional outlay, when Lee returned. The young man gave him a daily schedule which Rory showed. Each evening he was to procure, slaughter and cut up a definite and growing amount of meat. Every item was checked, and I saw that they ran from five pounds up to forty. What in heaven's name did you do with it? I demanded, excited now and pouring him an additional drink for fear caution might return to him. Took it through the bushes in the back and slung it in the mud sink there. And, Suthin, comes up on, drug it down. A gator. Diable. How should I know? It was dark. I wouldn't go close. He shuddered, and the fingers which lifted his glass shook as with a sudden chill. Meb you've done it, huh? Not me, though. The young fella told me to sling it in, and I slung it. A couple times I came around in the light, but there wasn't anything, there you could see. Just mud, and, some water. Meb the thing didn't come out in daytimes. Perhaps not, I agreed, straining every mental resource to imagine what Lee's sinister pet could have been. But you said something about two hogs a day. What did you mean by that? This paper, proof enough that you're telling the truth so far, states that on the 35th day you were to throw 40 pounds of meat any kind into the sink. Two hogs, even the piney woods variety, weigh a lot more than 40 pounds. Them was after after he came back. From this point onward, Rory's tail became more and more enmeshed in the vagaries induced by bad liquor. His tongue thickened. I shall give his story without attempting to reproduce further verbal barbarities, or the occasional prodding I had to give in order to keep him from wandering into foolish jargon. Lee had paid munificently. His only objection to the manner in which Rory had carried out his orders was that the orders themselves had been deficient. The pet, he said, had grown enormously. It was hungry, ravenous. Lee himself had supplemented the fare with huge pails of scraps from the kitchen. 
From that day Li purchased from Wari whole sheep and hogs. The Cajun continued to bring the carcasses at nightfall, but no longer did Li permit him to approach the pool. The young man appeared chronically excited. He had a tremendous secret one the extent of which even his father did not guess, and one which would astonish the world. Only a week or two more and he would spring it. First, he would have to arrange certain data. Then came the day when everyone disappeared from dead house. Rory came around several times, but concluded that all of the occupants had folded tents and departed doubtless taking their mysterious pet along. Only when he saw from a distance Joe, the octoroon servant, returning along the road on foot toward the lodge, did his slow mental processes begin to ferment. That afternoon Rory visited the strange place for the next to last time. He did not go to the lodge himself and there were reasons. While still some hundreds of yards away from the place a terrible, sustained screaming reached his ears. It was faint, yet unmistakably the voice of Joe. Throwing a pair of number two shells into the breech of his shotgun, Rory hurried on, taking his usual path through the brush at the back. He saw Anne as he told me, even, shinny, drunkenness fled his chattering tones Joe, the octoroon. I, he stood in the yard, far from the pool into which Rory had thrown the carcasses and Joe could not move. Rory failed to explain in full, but something, a slimy, amorphous something, which glistened in the sunlight, already engulfed the man to his shoulders. Breath was cut off. Joe's contorted face writhed with horror and beginning suffocation. One hand all that was free of the rest of him, beat feebly upon the rubbery, translucent thing that was engulfing his body. Then Joe sank from sight. Five days of liquor indulgence passed before Rory, alone in his shaky cabin, convinced himself that he had seen a fantasy born of alcohol. He came back the last time, to find a high wall of brick surrounding the lodge, and including the pool of mud into which he had thrown the meat. While he hesitated, circling the place without discovering an opening which he would not have dared to use, even had he found it a crashing, tearing of timbers, and persistent sound of awesome destruction came from within. He swung himself into one of the oaks near the wall. And he was just in time to see the last supporting stanchions of the lodge give way outward. The whole structure came apart. The roof fell in yet seemed to move after it had fallen. Logs of wall deserted layers of plywood in the grasp of the shearing machine. That was all. Suddenly intoxicated now, Rory mumbled more phrases, giving me the idea that on another day when he became sober once more, he might add to his statements, but I numbed to the soul scarcely cared. If that which he related was true, what nightmare of madness must have been consummated here? I could envision some things now which concerned Lee and Peggy, horrible things. Only remembrance of Elsie kept me faced forward in the search for now it seemed almost that the handiwork of a madman must be preferred to what Rory claimed to have seen. What had been that sinister translucent thing? That glistening thing which jumped upward about a man, smothering, engulfing? Queerly enough, though such a theory as came most easily to mind now would have outraged reason in me if suggested concerning total strangers, I asked myself only what details of Rory's revelation had been exaggerated by fright and fumes of liquor. And as I sat on the creaking bench in his cabin, staring unseeing as he lurched down to the floor, fumbling with a lockbox of green tin which lay under his cot, and muttering, the answer to all my questions lay within reach. It was not until the next day, however, that I made the discovery. Heavy of heart I had re-examined the spot where the lodge had stood, then made my way to the Cajun's cabin again, seeking sober confirmation of what he had told me during intoxication. In imagining that such a spree for Rory would be ended by a single night, however, I was mistaken. He lay sprawled almost as I had left him. Only two factors were changed. No, Shinny was left and lying open, with its miscellaneous contents strewed about, was the tin box. Rory somehow had managed to open it with the tiny key still clutched in his hand. Concern for his safety alone was what made me notice the box. It was a receptacle for small fishing tackle of the sort carried here and there by any sportsman. Tangles of Dawajiak minnows, spool hooks ranging in size to silverback number eights, 
three reels still carrying line of different weights, spinners, casting plus, wobblers, floating baits, were spilled out upon the rough plank flooring where they might snag Rory badly if he rolled. I gathered them, intending to save him from an accident. With the miscellaneous assortment in my hands, however, I stopped dead. Something had caught my eye something lying flush with the bottom of the lockbox. I stared, and then swiftly tossed the hooks and other impediments upon the table. What I had glimpsed there in the box was a loose-leaf notebook of the sort used for recording laboratory data. And Rory scarcely could read, let alone write. Feverishly, a riot of recognition, surmise, hope and fear bubbling in my brain, I grabbed the book and threw it open. At once I knew that this was the end. The pages were scribbled in pencil, but the handwriting was that precise chirography I knew as belonging to John Corliss Cranmer, the scientist. Could he not have obeyed my instructions? Oh, God! This! These were the words at the top of the first page which caught my eye. Because knowledge of the circumstances, the relation of which I pried out of the reluctant Rory only some days later when I had him in mobile as a police witness for the sake of my friend's vindication, is necessary to understanding, I shall interpolate. Rory had not told me everything. On his late visit to the vicinage of Dead House, he saw more. A crouching figure, seated Turk fashion on top of the wall, appeared to be writing industriously. Rory recognized the man as Cranmer, yet did not hail him. He had no opportunity. Just as the Cajun came near, Cranmer rose, thrust the notebook, which had rested across his knees, into the box. Then he turned, tossed outside the wall both the locked box and a ribbon to which was attached the key. Then his arms raised toward the heavens. For five seconds he seemed to invoke the mercy of power beyond all of man's scientific prying. And finally he leaped inside. Rory did not climb to investigate. He knew that directly below this portion of the wall lay the mud sink into which he had thrown the chunks of meat.